Last night, President Muhammad Buhari finally delivered his long-awaited address on COVID-19. And he announced a number of far-reaching decisions regarding the interventions, which, according to him, have become necessary if the spread of the disease must be halted. Key among these measures is the imposition of curfew, effective 11 p.m. today, on Lagos, Ogun State, and the Federal Capital Territory for an initial 14-day period. Already, millions of Nigerians are going through some form of confinement, particularly in Lagos, which has been the epicenter of the outbreak, where the authorities have been taking a number of steps to curtail the contagion. With the situation about to become more intense, how then can the authorities expect to have a functional feedback system in place for citizens to be able to express their concerns at this time? Healthcare airlines, outlines, is a, a relatively new phenomenon in Nigeria. And joining us now to look at the likely utilitarian value of this at this time is the man who pioneered it all, Akinjimo, a science journalist, night science journalism fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard School of Public Health and Bell Fellow in Development Studies. He's also the founder and executive director, Development Communications Network. Akinjimo, good morning. Thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. Good morning, Ruben. Quite some time. Good to see you. How is the family? Now, first, let's take your reaction to the president's uh, uh, address yesterday. Uh, many Nigerians had waited for the president to say something. Finally, yesterday, he took charge uh, of the uh, process of combating the war against uh, coronavirus. What's your take? in terms of the uh, content and the policy uh, choices expressed by the uh, president. Yeah, I think that was uh, a very good development when you look at the fact that we call the president the commander in chief. You know, the word from him more or less give uh, authority to virtually everyone working on the field. Uh, you look at what has been done by the federal health ministry uh, what has, is being done by the Lagos State government. And uh, when the commander in chief speaks about the issue, you know that, yes, Nigeria has taken charge in terms of everything that is going on when it comes to coronavirus. And people are more or less in the midst of all the negative stories that are going on. You know, we have a situation whereby we know that our government is behind us, our government knows what is going on and is ready to do the needful to address the pandemic. Well, I personally felt at ease, uh, felt more at ease yesterday when the president spoke. It felt like the captain was finally on deck. Uh, but it has taken a lot of pressure from Nigerians to get this speech. We've heard the president's handlers say it is a style not to talk and allow the professionals to do their work. We've also been told by another handler that the president will speak when it is necessary. So we finally heard him yesterday. But as a communication expert here, uh, what, what would you suggest and what advice would you give to the president's, uh, president's handlers and the president? How often should we hear him speak? One key thing is we need to have a system. When there is a system and the system is working well, you don't need the president to speak all the time. The main thing is there are experts that are working in this field. Look at uh, Chikwe. He went to China to look at what is going on, understudy and, and, and gain the experience and stuff like that. You look at what is going on in Lagos State, the Commissioner of Health, uh, Professor Akin Abayomi, has been hands on when it comes to coronavirus and so on and so forth. So the main thing is, for us to have information at our point of need. And when you look at coronavirus, you realize that it is an issue that concerns all of us as individuals, the, our way of life, just like issues that has to do with HIV, AIDS, and so on and so forth. There are quite a number of things that need Nigerians themselves, individuals, you know, to do something about it. And what we need is to have that information looking at the global experiences, looking at the systems in terms of what has government done to understand, understand what is going on, 
in a way that we have a lot of information and then we can now decide, okay, these are the things we need to do. Uh, but one key thing is we need to have someone with the authority of government, with the authority of, the authority of the president, you know, to talk to us about what is going on. You look at uh, Anthony Fauci, uh, for, I mean, in the U.S., with uh, um, President Trump, you know, Trump will say something, the, the, Anthony Fauci, who is a, uh, a scientist, you know, sometimes contradicts what the president is saying, looking at it from scientifically. So the thing is, we need our scientists to talk to us. We need our health expert, medical science uh, expert, to talk to us about the key issues. Why the president give that authority, you know, in terms of policy issues, in terms of what the country needs to do, you know, in a way that we can move forward. Well, yesterday, the uh, president outlined all the steps that have been taken so far by the federal government and also went further and announced a number of uh, policy uh, options. Do you consider some of the steps that have been taken so far adequate or you think that there are omissions? And if there are, uh, what are the additional steps that you think government should take? Previously, when we had uh, Rutu Sodiri here earlier, um, he talked about the banks uh, being considered as, as, as uh, essential service uh, providers. Do you think, for example, uh, that banks should be opened, even if it's only for two days a week? And do you think that this crisis, you haven't been a public health uh, you know, uh, reporter, and later you, you took a master's in uh, public health, do you think that there are additional steps that can be taken? You know, the key thing is, we need to have a system. We don't have a system. There are a number of, a number of reports that goes out, oh, uh, Governor Susan and Susu have had, uh, has tested positive, Susan and Susu has tested. What, what does that have to do with us as Nigerians? They are individuals like us. But if we have a system where our healthcare system works perfectly well, we had experience of HIV, we had experience of uh, uh, Ebola, Lassa fever is a major issue. How come we were running Elta Skelter to address the issue when it happens? And does it mean that we don't learn from the past? Yes, banks is very important. We need to have money in your pocket. But if your ATM card works, and we have a system whereby the, 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 the ATM uh, stations are filled up with money and not because people need money for transaction and so on and so forth. There are a number of things we need to do. Look at the, um, initially, people didn't have access to those information. We have more fake news than the real news at the moment. Yesterday, I saw a report that the first medical doctor in, uh, in Britain died, either yesterday or two days ago. But on social media, there were reports, something that a Nigerian, a Nigerian doctor has died. This was about a week or two weeks ago which means that that was fake. And quite a number of other things that we need to really put in place. Look at, we are now, we, we are looking at people to donate, you know, to have facilities, you know, to treat and all the other things. Our healthcare system cannot take this. Our, what do we do when we move forward from this? Because this will end. Coronavirus will end. But what happens after? As far back as, as, far back as 1994, I have this book called The Coming Plague. This was written by a science journalist, Laurie Garrett. This was 1994, about 26 years ago. Predicting the things that were happening, what are the things that is going to happen, and so on and so forth. I had to go and find this book again, to go through it again. Because things are, I mean, I, I, I really, because when you look at globalization, you look at uh, environmental issues, microbes have not gone away. We may have drugs, we may have everything, but microbes will continue. There will be, imagine infectious diseases, there will be things after corona. There will be other things. But how do we ensure that our healthcare system, thank God nobody can travel out to Guam for treatment. You know, we have the chief of staff coming down to Lagos for treatments, that is good. So we need to develop our healthcare system, not for today, but for tomorrow. What happens tomorrow matters a lot, and we have to do something about it. Right from Corona, we need to plan, we need to move, we need to, to make sure that we establish a system that will help the generality of Nigerians.
Dr. Jima, when we return from this break, I'll take you up on that communication uh, misinformation you mentioned earlier, but stay with us. Uh, let's go on this quick break. I'll be right back on The Morning Show. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on the Rise News. Akin Jima, a science uh, journalist, night science journalism fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard School of Public Health, a Bell Fellow in Development Studies, is still with us here in our Lagos studio. Thank you so much for uh, staying with us. Uh, you mentioned misinformation just before that break when we were responding to a question. And this is something the WHO is worried about. It says it's not just worried about the spread of coronavirus, but also the spread of false and misleading information about the virus, which it has now termed infodemic. Um, as a country, Nigeria, how worried should we be about this infodemic? What are your thoughts? How do we get the right message to the people at the right time? You know, in Nigeria, those days, we used to have what we call sanitary inspectors. Yorubas will call them wole wole, you know, whereby inspectors come to your house. If there is uh, any debt in your surrounding is dirty and all those things, you are arrested and taken to the local government authority and so on and so forth. We used to have that. We have the people we call health educators. Health educators are in charge of educating the public about key health issues. But where are the health ed educators now? We used to have, they used to be at Onikon, the Onikon Health Center, a one or two story building with a lot of equipment, cameras, you know, you have uh, photographers, you have everything. Right now, our health educator, you know, have been forgotten to a large extent. They are there at local government level, they are there at, at the state level, but what role have they play in moving forward about coronavirus? about HIV, about a number of other things. Remember that when HIV came, the picture we are seeing was the picture of skeletons, AIDS kill, and so on and so forth, because a few people will sit down around the table and say, okay, this is the message, okay, push it out. But the process of developing messages would take nothing less than a week or two weeks of developing, uh, you know, either for print, for electronic, and nowadays for digital platforms. And all those things, all those processes, were they activated or are we still activating them now? All those things we need to find a way to initiate and activate in a way that we have a, a robust kind of messaging system. But internet is ahead of us. People will sit down in the corner of their room and develop a message and send it out. Some people even send their own message. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, right now, I mean, so, so, and so, so, this is what I got. And we have this sickness of sent as received. What are you sending as received? Where is the message from? If a message is not from the health ministry, is not from WHO, is not from NCDC, where do you get the message from? And one of the key things is, as individuals, those in the health sector who have the information, we need to find a way to also be involved at our local, gov I mean, our local level. We are locked up in the, our homes now. What are you doing? You are making a call to people. What are you doing to address it? And all these things are necessary in the sense that your next door neighbor, if your next door neighbor has the, 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 the virus, then you are as well having it. Let me give you an example. You look at HIV AIDS in year 2000. HIV became a major problem. I mean, we've had it, the first case was as far back as 1986-87, and so on and so forth. And that time we didn't have internet and all those things, but people still get the message one way or the other. Traditional means, you know, still provide a venue for us to have those messages. But a lot of negative stories are out there. You push out something a few minutes ago talking about um, uh, the, uh, the Mr. Deshino saying that government is going to give 30,000 to so and so, so and that was carried by a major medium. So what are we talking about? So we in the media, we have a lot of role to play to make sure that 
we push out those cogent information, information that people will, will look at and utilize, you know, for their own good. And if there's any negative story, uh, fake news and stuff like that, you recognize it and you won't more or less tailor your, your thinking towards that. Well, uh, Akinjimo, let's spend a little more time on this uh, communication uh, messaging process uh, challenge. Uh, you've pointed out the uh, damage that the digital platforms can uh, cause. But in terms of strategy, do you think that the government is adopting a good strategy, communicating with the public? And what will you recommend? Because if we compartmentalize uh, the uh, options available, radio, which is the most popular form, uh, television, followed next by television because of the, of the advantage of audio and visual, and then, of course, the print. And then, you know, at the local levels, what will you recommend in terms of language? Most of the communication we've been getting has been uh, in the uh, English language. Will you recommend that, look, the message should be disseminated in local languages across uh, the country? The president yesterday was talking about social distancing. But the people in many places look like they are deaf. We still see a lot of people who are not observing social distancing. We still see a lot of prejudices. Is there a role for traditional rulers? Is there a role for religious leaders? Is there a role for the average citizen uh, to be responsible? You know, I, I, I work in uh, HIV. I, I work in polio. I worked in uh, Guinea worm eradication as a communication specialist. And the key thing is information is in the hands of 90% of people who don't need it. You and I, we know about what is going on. But those who have gate men, who have house help, do they know? It's just like, let's look at uh, tuberculosis, for example. You are a, a chief executive in a company and stuff like that. If your driver has TB, it means you've, you've had it. We all, you are in the same car, in the same vehicle. So the same thing with a lot of other, uh, you know, other diseases. And when it comes to coronavirus, the main thing is we converse a lot in our local language. But we conceptualize messages in English, translate to Yoruba, to Hausa, and so on and so forth. Why can't we conceptualize, you know, in those other languages, in our traditional languages, but all these things are more or less under the purview of our health educators, under the purview of our health promoters, who has a role. So it's just like looking at the health system. Healthcare system has a lot of cadres of experts who have expertise in different areas. Have we utilized those? Yes, the government has set up call centers. There were issues with the call centers initially. Those call centers are well, they are improving, that's what I would say. And if they are improving, what else can we do? Now you have call center, you have like two, three, four, five, six different numbers that you need to call. Why don't we have just one number that you have multiple people who can pick up? You know, when you call, um, when you call um, MTN or any of those other companies, any of those communication companies, you call, oh, Please, our call, our, our whatever, um, someone will pick your call later because there are multiple people who are sitting down. So we need to have a call center that is very standard, that, is, that, that has all the equipment and everything, that has all the, all, all the answers, you know, to what we need to do, that has a system of referral that can tell you where are you calling from. If you call and you are a Yoruba person, the person who will pick it will speak Yoruba to you, with you. If you're an outside person, an outside person will speak with you. And these are things that we've done even at individual level, not even government level. These are things, experiences that are available in this country, as far back as the year 2000 and so on and so forth. So, but the main thing is we need to review what we have at the moment. We need to look at what are the good things we've done and improve on it. What are the things that are not good enough then we need to re-strategize and take the next steps in a way that at every point in time, 
we meet people at that point of need. That is very important. Rather than asking someone who don't even know anything as well as you do. And confusion sets in and crisis continues. Indeed. Well, some survey and statistics says Nigeria is one of those countries with the highest mobile penetration or even smartphones penetration. And I'd like to bring in the telecom uh, sector here, the operators. You've mentioned one. Uh, there are others that the NCDC uh, has singled out in partnership so far that have come on board. But what would be your advice to these telcos uh, at a time like this? Because this is a fight for all. What can they do differently? How can they help break that barrier of communication gap uh, to get to those people in the rural areas, the people you talk about, who do not understand, who may not understand, you know, the crisis we are in at this time? What's the responsibility of those telecommunication giants at this time? You know, the, the, the key thing is um, we have the technology, but do we have the will? If you're in the US, there's a crisis, there's a medical thing. All you need to do is call 911. You call 911, the issue is addressed. You have, hair, you have ambulances, you have policemen, you have everyone come to that location and what is going on and they resolve it. Now, for us, there are several numbers to call. The other time they were saying that, okay, we are, uh, we are going to activate the 112 or you know, some other numbers. So there are so many numbers. Why don't we you know, collapse most of these things? Maybe not for now. But after this, we need to sit down and address our health sector. Look, in year 2000, they, we conceptualized the, 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 the HIV AIDS hotline at that time. At that time, a lot of people, young people like us, like all of us, were coming down with HIV. The military then said they had killed about 30 soldiers and so on and so forth, which as journalists, we said, look, this will not be true. And one of the key things that was done was to use a private phone line at that time. That time, I was still a journalist. I was reporting and stuff like that. And we look at, look, we're in the forefront of this thing. What can we do? There was a phone line, 774-8397, a multi-links number at that time. And a couple of us journalists came together and said, look, let's push this number out. When people need information about HIV and so on, so let's do something about it. And when we write stories those days, people will put the number. If you need more information, call this number. And at that time, my wife and I, we were the one that would receive the call. We did that for 18 months with no funding from anybody. And after that, there was support, seven phone lines. We trained about 30 young people to answer the calls. All this one were private initiative. Young people were answering the calls. Then at a point, people were calling in Yoruba, speaking in Yoruba, speaking in Hausa. We had to train people who speak those languages and those things continue for several years to the point that one of the tele, tele, uh, telephone companies gave us a number that is toll free. That number still exists. But the key thing is having the will, having a system, you know, in a way that at any point in time, you have an accident on the road, you know the number to call. And on Lagos the Express, you have an ambulance that is linked up that will come to you. Road safety has a role to play. So we need to look at what we have, institutions that we have, how do we collaborate together in a way that we solve the problem that affect Nigeria? Not fighting for money. Money, when you throw money at something, money is not going to solve the problem. Yes, the president has said, so and so, so billion and all the other things. What, where is the accountability component of, or component of it? Are we we'll, going we'll to spend to... it wisely? Are we going we'll to do something? We we'll need to wrap up in uh, less than a minute. Uh, but your point about the helplines uh, is quite valid, but we know that there is, uh, in Lagos State, 767, and then the NCDC has also announced helpline 080-0800-970-00010. But how they manage those helplines is another matter. Thank you very much, Akinjimov.